in this moment in this place i remember who i am letting fear and worry fall away from me i open my eyes and see there is a Thank you, Deb. And welcome everyone from coast to coast. I believe this might be our first time ever doing a, a cross Canada Good Friday service. So let us enjoy and rejoice and share together. And as I said, before we started recording, we will have some time of fellowship if you're able to stay for a few moments afterwards, uh, meet and greet, but let us Move into our time together with prayer. I invite you to allow my words to be your words. Allowing the past to be in the past, the future to be in the future. And to the best of your ability, bring yourself to the now moment. This place of oneness. This place where our divinity resides the I am of our being. And on this holy day, one of recognition of a path previously taken. Did you hear that? No. Oh, okay. no, we're good. We allow ourselves to move into this space, this place. And just breathing into the moment, giving ourselves permission, letting our intellect know that it's okay to just be for the next hour. To be with like-minded people, to be with people who are on a similar journey and to explore just for a little while, our own innate Christ self and for the technology that is allowing us to come together in this way across the country, across the time zones, across the mountains, across the oceans, we are so grateful. And so it is, and so it shall be. Amen. And now I'll ask Debbie to read our daily word. I am willing to forgive. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is so attuned to divine love that he asks forgiveness for those who are putting him to death. Jesus' example inspires me to release any resentment, bitterness, or anger I feel, no matter how much I believe those feelings are justified. I recognize that unwillingness to forgive blocks my awareness of love's flow. If the burden of resentment is so overwhelming that I feel I cannot forgive, my willingness opens the way. I am willing to forgive. Let's repeat that. I am willing to forgive. I hold this thought repeating it silently each time the memory of a past hurt arises, feeling my willingness grow stronger with each repetition. I feel renewed peace and joy as the strength of divine love heals my heart and releases unforgiveness. I forgive and I am free. 
Luke 23, 34 says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I am willing to forgive. Thanks, Deb. And now I'd like to share our Lenten reading portion for today. I release the shadows of grief and sorrow. And Jesus' final, final moments of his human journey, as told in John 19, verse 30, he said, it is finished. The final days of our Lenten journey offer an opportunity to reflect on our spiritual growth. Such reflection shines a light on the blessings we have received, gifts of friendship, love, understanding, and support. It also reveals those places where we may have fallen short, where perhaps we withheld many of the same gifts we received. As these are revealed, a choice is available. I can cling to the grief and sorrow over missteps I have made, or I can humbly accept the learning offered and draw closer to the all-loving presence of God within me through their release. This indwelling presence knows no misstep and finds no fault. It simply pours forth, dispelling shadows and lighting the path away, ahead, sorry. As I relieve shadows of grief and sorrow, I can say to the hold they have once had, it is finished. And from Psalm 139 verses 11 and 12, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now Debbie's going to share one of her own compositions, I Walk With God In My Heart. And it's really easy, so I hope you can sing along at home with me. I walk with God in my heart, with love and peace and joy. I walk with God in my heart, every minute, every day, it is my choice. I walk with God in my heart, with love and peace and joy. I walk with God in my heart, every minute, every day, it is my choice choice. I may have days where I'm lonely. I may have moments of pain. And I can choose to surrender or not and live with God in my heart. I walk with God in my heart, with love and peace and joy. I walk with God in my heart, every minute, every day, it is my choice. I walk with God in my heart, with love and peace and joy. I walk with God in my heart, every minute, every day, it is my my choice. I may have days where I'm grieving. I may have moments of tears. And I can choose to surrender or not and live with God in my heart. I walk with God in my heart. With love and peace and joy, I walk with God in my heart. Every minute, every day, it is my choice. I walk with God in my heart. With love and peace and joy, I walk with God in my heart heart every minute every day it is my choice i may have days where i'm anxious i may have moments of fear and i can choose to surrender or not and live with God in my heart. I walk with God in my heart. With love and peace and joy, I walk with God in my heart. Every minute, every day, it is my choice. I walk with God in my heart. With love and peace and joy, I walk with God in my heart. 
field. Every minute, every day, it is my choice. Every minute, every day, it is my choice. Every minute, every day, it is my choice. Thanks, Deb. Love that song. And contrary to the slide that was sent out, I reserved the right to change my mind and we're going to do the spiritual communion first. So I hope you have your uh, pieces of, of uh, food in front of you or within arm's reach. So we're going to continue the story from where we left off on Palm Sunday. Jesus came into Jerusalem, as you may recall, to celebrate the, the Passover feast. And we can look at this, and we in unity do look at this, not only as potentially a historical event, but also in the metaphysics, that idea that this is actually our journey as well, that this is our place, this is our representation. We may experience betrayals, we may experience trials, we may experience what feels like a crucifixion, and we can experience resurrections on our human path. When we go through our gospels, we discover that there are four gospels. And as things happen, each of them has a different focus. And so it's bringing the whole story together from all four gospels that we get kind of the, the true nature of what it is we're trying to do here. It's kind of like making a, a Bible stew. You need all the ingredients to get the final product. So as we pick up the story, Jesus has come together with the disciples and other followers to observe the Passover. And we see a very human experience. They're squabbling amongst themselves. They're debating who's going to be the greatest. Peter is swearing that he will be truthful and, and, and faithful to the end. And of course, Judas is invited to go and do what he needs to do and do it quickly. Not exactly the, the holiest of times. For me, at least, perhaps for you, it does sound like that. To me, it sounds like a typical family dinner. You know, we're just missing the kids table. What we know about this Passover feast is that it has become the foundation for the Catholic Mass, for the Protestant communion, and in unity for our spiritual communion. And by spiritual communion, I'm going to invite you to release whatever theology you might have grown up with or experienced in your life's journey, just, just for the next few minutes, okay? You can go back to it if you want to afterwards, but I'm just going to present to you a different way of looking at it. I grew up in a faith community that was very much into blame and shame. In fact, the reason I left my church of origin uh, was because of Good Friday, where I was told I needed to go to the front, pick a nail, pick a hammer, and hammer it into the wooden cross at the front of the church as a symbol of my responsibility for the crucifixion. Now, I was younger at the time. Uh, but even then, I had an inner knowing that that wasn't right for me, that that was not who I was. That was not my understanding of God. That was not my understanding of Jesus. Uh, and so I decided that I needed to find a, another path for myself. So let's begin with our bread. I'm not sure what kind of bread was used. Um, it might have been a matzah, an unleavened bread like a matzah or perhaps something closer to a, a pita or a naan, an, an unleavened loaf. Or we could have had yeasted bread of some description. I don't know. For my, for my uh, bread today, I've chosen one of my favorite little granola bars with chocolate on top. And I've chosen that, um, aside from the fact that it tastes really good, but I've chosen that because that's what's in my purse when I'm out shopping, when I'm out running errands. And that's my reminder that I don't need to go and buy something else. I have within my purse, within my persona, that uh, treat that will allow me to regain some carbs, perhaps a little protein because there's nuts in it. And that will allow me to do what is humanly mine to do. And so... We are in this place of 
taking it as a symbol, not of the body of Jesus, but we take it a slightly different way. We take it as the idea of taking in divine ideas, taking in that concept of this is mine to do. Because I don't have to, I don't have to get dressed or anything. I can just listen to it. And so we can choose what we want to be our bread in our life. And we have the authority to consecrate it for ourselves. So what we can do here is consider for a moment how bread is made. Indeed, how many things that are more solid is made. It takes time. If you're using a yeasted bread, you have to allow it to proof. You have to allow the protein gluten to create, be created within the bread before you put it to heat. And in that heat, all of the chemicals come together and produce something amazing. If you just took the, the water and the flour and possibly some eggs, whatever, and ate it raw, like yuck. But as we go through, you know, that's kind of like us going through some trials in life, that we have that heat applied to us that transforms the, I, the initial ingredients into something much more useful. Metaphysically, bread re represents substance. If you think about it, you know, you could survive on bread and water for a, a significant period of time. You need those carbohydrates though. You need those proteins. You need those calories from the bread, whether it's a matzo or a naan or a pita or a granola bar or whatever. You need that substance within you. And so too, we need that metaphysical substance to work through us on a spiritual level. Her daily bread is our substance for mind, spirit, and body. And when we partake of this, we can focus our minds and thoughts on the Christ. And now I invite you to just mindfully say a blessing over your bread, however it looks to you to bless it for the nourishment that it is going to give you, to bless it for that focus of you that is you and that allows you to do what you need to do, not only on the physical level, but also on the spiritual level. And so we just bless that appreciate it. Appreciate the hands that created this. Appreciate the divine idea of the machines that might have assisted in the creation of this, whether in the packaging or in the stirring or in the baking. And just acknowledge that this is something that will bless us. And now I invite you, this is the bread of divine ideas. Take it and eat. I accept the bread of divine ideas. And now we move into the wine. And if you think about it, any liquid that we ingest shy of being at a river and taking some water out of that stream goes through some sort of processing. It isn't immediately available to us. There are things that need to be done, whether it's pressing grapes to make the wine, fermenting the wine, or roasting coffee beans, or picking tea leaves and, and drying them, or peeling an orange and allowing the juice to come out of that, whatever it is. We need that time. We need that opportunity to create that liquid. One of the things I, I know for myself, um, having had some health challenges over the years, is that the first thing a health practitioner, or one of the first things a health practitioner will do, is just pinch your skin to see if you're dehydrated. Are you physically dehydrated? 
If so, that is a key part of your growing back into a fullness of well-being. As we go through this spiritually, ingesting that liquid, think of a cold day and that first sip of coffee or hot chocolate or hot tea, that, that idea of and that experience of that flow as it goes through your body and warms you, or alternatively, on a hot day, that iced water or iced tea or lemonade or whatever, how it immediately responds in your body, how it causes that response of, oh, that feels good. Oh, I didn't realize how thirsty I was. So too, we take the wine symbolically and we acknowledge the vitality that it brings into our bodies because our bodies are able to adjust it immediately. It doesn't have to break it down the way it does with the bread. We can immediately feel the effects as our body is rehydrated. And so too spiritually, as we take the wine, we are acknowledging that connection between our soul and our body, representing an all pervading free essence that is generated from nerve substance or water of life, that feeling of being infilled, that feeling of, ah, yes, that feeling of connection to ourselves. And this is our representative of our Christ life. It is eternal. We talk about the flow of the water in the rain system, that it goes through. It doesn't end. It just recycles itself. And so now I invite you to take your fluid, whatever it is. Mine happens to be a cup of tea. And just take a moment to bless the eternal Christ life that is represented by this fluid. To bless everyone who had a hand in creating this. For me, I bless those who planted the tea plants, who picked the leaves, who processed them, who packaged them and brought them to the store so I could buy it and add my hot water and bring a nice cup of tea to myself. And spiritually, I acknowledge that this is a way of refreshing and renewing myself that I partake and remind myself of my Christ self as I take a sip. And I invite you to take the wine of eternal Christ light, take it and drink. I accept the wine of eternal Christ light. These outward symbols truly nourish our physical body as well as serving as an outward reminder of the spiritual meaning of divine ideas and eternal Christ light. As we continue our life's journey, we can choose to consciously remind ourselves of this truth at any moment. It doesn't have to be formalized. It doesn't have to be ritualized. It does not require anyone else to do the blessing but yourself. It is an opportunity to remind yourself to do these things in recognition of the Christ expressing as you. Let it be so and so it is. A crown of thorns placed on his head. He knew that he would soon be dead. He said, did you forget me? Father, did you? They nailed him to a wooden cross. Soon all the world would feel the loss of Christ the King before. He 
hung his head and prepared to die, then lifted his face up to the sky, said, I am coming home now, Father, to you. A reed which held his final step was gently lifted to his lips. He drank his last and gave his soul to glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The soldier who had used his sword to pierce the body of our Lord said, truly this is Jesus Christ, our Savior. He looked with fear upon his sword, then turned his face to the Lord, fell to his knees, cried, took from his head the thorny crown and wrapped him in a linen gown and laid him down to rest inside the tomb. The holes in his hands, his feet, his side, now in our hearts we know he died to save us from ourselves. Three days went by, again they came to move the stone, to bless the slain with oil and spice, anointing, hallelujah. But as they went to move the stone, they saw that they were not alone, but Jesus Christ has risen. Thank you, Deb. That was amazing. Thank you. So now we move into the Good Friday portion of our time together. Jesus is described as removing himself from the upper room where the Passover feast had been held. He removes himself to pray alone. The Gospels don't agree on specific details, but there is a common theme. Jesus is wrestling with himself, recognizing the need to surrender the human will. You may have heard the phrase, not my will, but thine be done. We also have experiences where we're asked to give up. The good for the better. To leave relationships, to leave employment, to give up a home which has become unhealthy for us. Where it feels like we're losing everything for something unknown. 
And I'm sure that there was some feeling of that for Jesus, that at the human level, there was some fear, perhaps, that he really didn't want to go through with what was to come. I know for myself, there have been a number of things in my life that, gee, I wish I couldn't, I could have avoided that. But in the end, looking back now, it could have been no other way for myself. So the 11 last, the seven last words or the seven last phrases. So this is, comes into the time of greatest trial, having been questioned and re-questioned, abused by persons in power, soldiers authorized to use any force they wish, Jesus begins his walk to his human death. These seven last words or statements do not appear in all the gospels. Bible scholars have determined a chronological order. As we will see momentarily, they can be grouped into three sections, each representing a step away from the human and further into the expression of the divine. Each of these steps can also be reflective of the spiritual steps with each of us will also take in varying sizes. Sometimes we have to take a huge step to remove ourselves from a toxic environment. Other times it's just a little step. Perhaps we decide to make a change in our diet to be healthier. Remember though, the goal is resurrection. This appearance of suffering and death is simply a letting go of that which no longer serves and is actually hindering the greater expression of the Christ self we already are. And to give you a metaphysical definition of crucifixion, every time we give up error, there is a crucifixion. In Wendy's words, every time we give up a thought or a belief or a habit or an action or something that we were enamored of, we might experience a crucifixion as we let go of that. So the first section is the words of human obligation. It's the first three statements. We experience similar obligations when we make life changes, whether it be at a job, where we live, who is part of our circle of friends. We may already have legal documents in place which outline what medical care is to be offered or withheld. Who has the authority to make decisions on our behalf if we're not able to? And what is to happen with our worldly possessions when we leave this human world? The first word, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. And our metaphysical understanding of this is loving forgiveness, not criticism, not condemn, condemning, but loving forgiveness is vital to our spiritual life of ourselves as well as others. Remember the great commandment, love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. Many people will focus on the love your neighbor part, forgetting that the standard is how do you love yourself? Because only in how you love yourself will you be able to love your neighbor. And only in loving yourself will you be able to do your forgiveness work. The second word, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. In unity, we metaphysically understand that paradise is not a physical location but is rather the state of living in a consciousness of peace and wholeness. That idea, that choice of will I react or will I find that calm within myself in spite of what is happening around me? Will I choose to turn within in a time of challenge, in a time of dis uh, of disorder? Will I find that calm within me to do this? When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, the third word, woman, here is your son. Here is your mother. John 19, 26 to 27. 
this for me is the last of the true human aspects of Jesus. He is being a good son and ensuring that his mother is taken care of. He is relinquishing the responsibilities that he would have had to ensure that his mother was protected, to ensure that his mother was clothed, to ensure that she was housed and fed. And so with this, he has released the last of his human responsibilities. Metaphysically, we are understanding that we discharge human responsibilities as we turn into towards a more spiritual expression. We willingly and lovingly do this gently. Oftentimes letting go of our human requirements is the most difficult. And yet it is one of the most important steps towards creating that space for a greater expression of our Christ self. Having ensured that his worldly obligations were complete, we move into the next phase. The Gospel of John spends four chapters capturing what Jesus taught to teach his disciples in their last hours together. So we have this idea of he's done everything he can. He has spoken to the disciples. He has taken care of his mother. And these next two words express the agony and anguish of the human experience as we experience that going through of letting go, of moving towards our greater. The fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 4 and Mark 15, 34. This is, to me, this is one of the great balances of the human and the, the divine. Because Jesus is actually quoting from the Psalms. As we in unity might go to a favorite passage from Fillmore or Katie or Butterworth or other authors, or we might go to scriptures. Jesus here is quoting from the, second, the 22nd Psalm. And those in the crowd who were regular participants in services would have recognized what he was referring to. I won't give you the full uh, psalm, it's kind of lengthy, but let me just give you a taste of what it was like. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him the rescue the one in whom he delights. Yet it was you who took me from the womb. You kept me safe on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and since my mother bore me, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Can you feel the words in that? We might sort of shudder a little bit. It seems rather angry. But can we feel that anguish of letting go of the human side? and acknowledging you are my God, I am yours, here I am. Metaphysically, we understand that when we are experiencing a crucifixion spiritually, that Jesus passed through a similar period. And the challenge for us, as it was for Jesus, is to per persevere until the manifestation is complete whether it is an outer manifestation of something that we desire, a relationship, a new car, a new way of expressing ourselves in our employment, whatever it is, or whether it's a way of being kinder to ourselves and taking more time with our food or adding to our meditation time or adding to our exercise time, whatever it is, inner, innerly or outwardly, we need to persevere 
until we see that it is done. And when it feels like we are being forsaken, that God has forgotten us, that our friends have forgotten us, let us remind ourselves that Jesus too brought forward that psalm, asking that question, and that if he could do it, so can we. The fifth word, I am thirsty, John 19, 28. The body has physical needs. We all agree on that. And thirst, as I said during our communion time, is a core one. Being dehydrated is not a good thing for the human body. But we also thirst for the understanding of our spirituality. We also thirst for something greater than we experience in our daily lives. We have this need to be spiritually and humanly fed and given drink. From Adam Smashing Power of Mind by our co-founder Charles Fillmore. When the crucifixion comes and you are suffering the pangs of dying error, and by error he means thoughts, beliefs, habits that do not serve us in an affirmative way. This is when you need to realize that you are passing through a transformation process that will be followed by a resurrection of all that is worth saving. Think of the flood of, uh, I was going to say flutterby. Think of the butterfly. It starts as a caterpillar. It has a definite need to eat and produce the chrysalis. And then something happens there. It becomes like mush. It cannot go back to being a caterpillar. It must go to becoming a butterfly. So too with us, when we feel like we're being torn apart, it is because something new is being created and we cannot go back to where we were before. We can try, some succeed, but at what cost? Often we find that those who go backwards to past addictions, to past toxic relationships, to past beliefs that do not serve in a, a supportive way, that they become ill. And so we can choose, and it is our choice. We are not forced to do so, but we can choose to process through this change in ourselves. The words of surrender to the spiritual, the final two. At this point, the human body is beginning to break down. The crucifixion of Jesus represents the wiping of personality out of consciousness. We deny the human self so that we may not unite with the selfless. We give up the mortal and the focus on the mortal so that we can attain the immortal and experience that oneness that we are. This is when you take that final step. This is when you've been thinking about something about a change to your life, about something that you've read or heard that just has said, I want more like that. This is where you make a life change, which will irrevocably alter the path that you are on. The sixth word, it is finished. John nineteen thirty. Jesus had received the word. He said these words, then he bowed his, his head and gave up his spirit. The human effort metaphysically is complete. We release ourselves to God and the Christ expressing as us. This is the point at which we ingest, we take in whatever it is that is coming to us, that we acknowledge it as ours and we acknowledge what we have let go of. And we see ourselves in this new light knowing that we are about to embark on something new and wonderful. The seventh word, Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Luke 23, 46. Unity has described the crucifixion as a crossing out. It's a crossing out of the thoughts and beliefs around sin and death. That we acknowledge that we do make errors, but that we have the capacity to forgive ourselves for them, to make amends as appropriate, 
and to move forward from that without carrying that burden forward with us. We move into a manifestation where our body and our mind and our heart breathe into this new experience. Who I was last Good Friday is not who I am today. I commended my spirit of last year, last year. And now I move forward into a place of allowing whatever is to come as we move through the time of the tomb tomorrow into the glorious resurrection of Easter Sunday, into that spirit, into that newness, into who I am called to be, and indeed who each of you is called to be. This is not to say that it's an easy journey, but in Jesus providing us a way of looking at these seven last statements, in giving us a, a pathway to say, as we let go of the human, so we can move into the Christ that we are in this lifetime, in this moment. And so it is. And as we allow our brains to process that, Debbie, would you please share another song? Thank you. Thanks, Deb, for sharing of your time and talent today. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. And now, as we go forward towards the Easter awareness, let us gently consider those thoughts, beliefs, actions, habits that no longer serve us and release them, recognizing that we have been strengthened by our acceptance of the bread of divine ideas and the wine of eternal Christ light. And we join together, the light of God surrounds us. I am light. The love of God enfolds us. I am love. The power of God protects us. I am power. The presence of God watches over us. I am presence. Wherever we are, God is. I am divine. Thank you for joining Debbie and I today. It's been our joy and privilege to share this time with you. Debbie will close our time together with one of her own compositions, then we'll stop the recording and have some fellowship time. Blessings. Thank you. So Jesus was our amazing way shower. 
And he was um, our role model because he let his real self out. So my question to you is, will you let your real self out? It was the Sunday of her first sermon. She stood at the front of the church. She started to pray for release of her fears, having the faith that spirit was near. She had practiced that message for days in many, many different ways. Knowing the message that she would share was not just for the other people there. Will you let the real you out? Will you let the real you out? Turn within and from your heart ask, will you let the real you out? From her inner voice she heard, will you let the real you out? And stand in the truth of who you are, will you let the real you out? The man in the second last pew, whose accomplishments he thought were few listened intently to what she had said and couldn't get the question out of his head will you let the real you out he wanted to stand up and shout knowing he'd never before allowed humbly feeling it would be too proud Will you let the real you out? Will you let the real you out? Turn within and from your heart ask, will you let the real you out? From his inner voice he heard, will you let the real you out? And stand in the truth of who you Will you let the real you out? So what are you holding back and telling yourself that you lack? Knowing in your heart your gifts are many, so right here and right now, stop denying you have any, for you are the light of the world. Every man, woman, boy and girl, stand in the truth for all to see, filling this life with joy and peace. Will you let the real you out? Will you let the real you out? Turn within and from your heart ask, Will you let the real you out? Yes, I'll let the real me out. Yes, I'll let the real me out. And stand in the truth of who I am. I am the light of the world. Yes, I am the light of the world. And so are each of you. Thank you.